Did you have any connection with Ice Cube coming to the East Coast after beefing with NWA and pairing them up with the Bomb Squad? Yes, I did. Ice Cube reached out to me on the set of Yo! TV Raps when he was making his announcement about leaving NWA. He grabbed me to the side and said, look, man, could you get me in contact with uh, Chuck and the Bomb Squad? I said, sure. He said, I want to know if they can help us. We put first record together. I said, I'll get on the phone. I'll take care of that. I did that, got in contact with them, got them assembled at 510 South Franklin. Keith rode back out to the city with me in my Jeep, and we picked up Ice Cube and his girlfriend, fiance at the time. I drove them back to South Frank, uh, 510 South Franklin in Hempstead, New York, waltzed them up into, this, into the, uh, the public enemy or the Spectrum City office, and then henceforth the deal became. I put that together. You put that connection came through you. Yes, it did. Same how Public Enemy was signed to Def Jam through me. Because I was the one being the DJ with the Beasties. And I played again another BAU promo that we did. Most of the records in the early Public Enemy days were things we did at BAU promos. Public Enemy number one was one of them. It was Chuck got angry because we did a party in Rockville Center. And a guy came in to shoot it up and try to take the money. Didn't happen. But because of these incidents repeat themselves, it made it difficult for us to create or keep a living and be able to rent, you know, uh, uh, halls because no one wanted us to do that because it'd be fights and windows broken. So the expense outweighed the the um, the uh, uh, profit. So Chuck got when Chuck gets mad, he'd go in the studio, and he made this thing called Public Enemy Number One. So the original one talks about uh, all these other groups trying to do what we do, and they get incidents that happen. So when we come back. When they go into those halls, they say, nope, you guys can't do this anymore. We get shut down because you walked in for a one shot and we would go in there consistently and frequently. So I used to have that tape on me all the time when we'd have tape battles on the buses or vans we were in with the Beasties. So I'd bring my box and I'd play music. They'd bring their box and play music. And then they heard that and I'd go, whoa, 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 what is that? Public Enemy Number 1 by Chuck E. D. That's why. And then Rick would, he annoyed me. You gotta give me Chucky D. Dre, Dre, you gotta give me Chucky D. You gotta give me Chucky D. You gotta give me Chucky D. I said, Rick, I'm talking to him. He doesn't want to record anymore. Chuck didn't want to record anymore because he had done a record called Spectrum City, Lies and Check Out the Radio on Vanguard. See how I deal with detail? Um, and it didn't go out too well for them with that song. Good song. A lot of people remember Check Out the Radio, Lies. It didn't go out that well. Double A-sided record. And, um, they didn't want to do, you wouldn't do it anymore. So we used to DJ at a place out in um, East Islip called Entourage, which before that was called Twilight. Again, details. And we would do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we would DJ on Wednesday night and Thursday night. But our home place was Twilight. It was like a place we knew we could always go and people would come out and check us out. But we hit the winter months with it. At that time, I had already had original concept signed. Finished the record. Keith Shockley was in the studio, matter of fact, when we recorded it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was telling him, look, man, Rick really wants to sign Chuck and him. And Chuck was like, I don't want to do that. My home is here. I'm not, that's just, a, that's, that's Dre, you do that. You got, you the artist. And then what are we going to do with the original concept? He said, you're going to do what you want to do with it. We with you. Let's do it. Whatever you need us to do. So we're laughing about it. I said, yeah, but why don't we sign a public game? Then at least we got two groups on Def Jam and we, we could do what we're doing, but it's groups. I see it. I do it with the Beasties. Then we do we do shows, parties. I'm out all the time doing other stuff. Now nah, we don't want to do it. And I was right in front of Three Third Place in Roosevelt when we had this big argument in my in my van at the time. So they decided not to do it. So I convinced Bill Stephanie to sign on and actually work at Def Jam after he worked out his contract with them. I said, Bill, it'd be good for you to be in there for us. So whatever shenanigans go on, at least we know we got you there with our back. Mm -hmm. So he actually ended up talking more with Chuck. And that's kind of how we push the deal along. So a lot of people think, oh, well, Jam Master J did it. No, Dre did it. Because Rick kept calling me all the time about signing Chucky e. D, Chucky e. D. So you were a connector between a lot of what became hip hop history. Do you know why, you know, just going back to this Ice Cube thing, he's on the West Coast. What was it about the sound? on the east side that made him want to reach out to you? Because it was so far from what they were doing in NWA. Did 
Did he ever speak to you why he wanted you to connect him with Bond? Because there was a lot of producers out at the time that he could have worked with. But it not the energy that Chuck could give him. And remember, Ice Cube leaving NWA at the time was a very big risk. Yes. And at that moment, Public Enemy was on the cusp of everybody's lips. Anything they did was hip hop history. So for Ice Cube to want to depart and to go take a risk, remember that was a big risk. What if he went and he did it with somebody at West Coast or did it with a different producer and it flopped? He would never get that opportunity of life again. Then he would be discredited because Dre and them rolled right along. Mm -hmm. How do you compete with that? The difference of the West Coast sound and the East Coast sound, first of all, it's all horse shit to me. Because it was the same thing. It's just different times. Everything that Dre and them did, we had already done. We were in the funk mode at one time, but then we adjusted to a different mode. Then we jumped on James Brown. They moved and went deep with the funk. They went to the live performance stuff. We all did different things that created a sound based on what you did in your communities. So we couldn't, I couldn't drop a record here and know what was going to happen in Compton. And Compton couldn't drop a record in Compton and know what was going to happen out here in Long Island. But there was one person that really did bring all of this stuff together. And his name is Greg Royal, who was out there engineering for all of that. Greg Royal was one of my rival DJs and good friend that I grew up with in Newcastle. He had a group called Music Mind. And when you turn over the chronic, his name is there. Mm. Turn over the early NWA stuff, his name is there. Mixmaster G in the Turntable Orchestra. That's Greg Royal. So when I heard those songs, I said, how do they know these songs? This is what we was leading in the park with. Greg Royal. Mm. That's why I was never like, oh my God, this is so incredible. How did he come up with that? Greg Royal. Now, did he credit for all of it? Am I taking any away from Dre? Nothing. Dre was, I was on sessions with him, listening to him do stuff. We were supposed to do a record together. But people get it miscued. I guess like, like Dean Martin, uh, well, Jerry Lewis says, it always sticks in my mind. Usually it's the camps that get you into trouble, not when you're individually together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the separation of Ice Cube from NWA came down to one thing, money. Money. It's always that. It's always the dollars. Yes, it is. The final episode of Yo, huge, huge episode. Everybody remembers, if you were born in that era, that was one of those moments. Y'all had everybody on set. That was We Are The World, Live Aid, and uh, <laughs> a few other things all rolled into one. All rolled into one. Woodstock, Watt Stacks, you name it. All rolled into this brief moment, which no one thought it was going to... MTV, honestly, was angry about it. So they were like, no, no, the show's not going off the air. But we were going off the air. So, I'm, it, it, memory serves me right, because there were people on that set that had problems with each other. I remember Third Base being on the set, yes. MC him. I remember the last Yo! MTV raps. Ed Lover was nice enough, and Ted Demi, may he rest in peace, called me and like, yo, you know, you should come down here, be part of the freestyle and all of that. So I came down there, and I was working with a group at, uh, called Nonfiction at the time. So I had like 20 goons with me, like Necro and Ill Bill. Like I had like mad goons with me. And uh, I got to do my little freestyle, and towards the end, Ed says to me, he's like, yo, you know, Hammer's here. Let's just, yo, it'd be perfect. The end of Yo! MTV raps, you and Hammer just make peace. And I look at Ed and I was like, yo, Hammer's here? And I just went, ooh, ooh! And all my boys pulled their ratchets. Because like, we were all carrying. I, I just wanted to find them. And we couldn't, we couldn't find them. But that's where my head was in 1994. How, how did y'all control that? There was because no control. There was no control. You know what the control was? This is your own TV raps. Dr. Dre, Ed Lover, T Money. What are you talking about? Ted Demi, what are you talking about? The only beef here is if you go down the corner and get it from Wendy's. There's no beefs. That's what so I said. So a lot of beefs are made up to, to fit the narrative of the moment. You can probably get Search and Hammer in the room right now and they'd have a good laugh. 
But everybody, remember, we gonna keep it real. I called it real stupid. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? The one thing about Yo TV Raps, which was the great healer in hip hop at that time. Because if there was a problem, you go on Yo MG Raps, squash it out. It'd go away. Oh, that wasn't so important. Or Ed and I would talk about it. And it would go away. Because it didn't matter. And I still believe to this day, in my heart of hearts, deep in my soul, if MTV did not cancel Dr. Dre and Ed Lover, T-Money, or for the daily Yo MTV Raps, there was no reason to do it. Tupac and Notorious B.I.G. would be alive today. It would never have escalated that much. Not as much as it got out of control. Why was this show canceled? Because rapid going mainstream. It was on daily MTV. Remember, Yo MTV Raps was a specialty show. And then they, they also were af afraid this, like, Ed and Dre are bigger than the show. Oh, no, it's the videos. They always had an excuse. Mm -hmm. Oh, they served enough for their time. So when I watch other shows that are on there forever, and it's like, really, I guess that philosophy they had back then is not in, in effect at this moment. Remember what happened when Dick Clark left American Bandstand or Don Cornelius left Soul Train? It still aired, mm -hmm. but nobody watched. We became synonymous we with did. that show. Yes, you did. We were your own TV raps. And that's why when I made the request years ago about us being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the same way Dick Clark is, Don Cornelius is, and amazingly enough, I was rumor has it, someone who's on television right now said, oh, no, no, we shouldn't put them on. But we put their little group on consistently because that's where they got notif notoriety from. And that person doesn't know that I know this. But when I see him face to face, I will confront him. The person said, so you said Dr. Ain't that lover shouldn't be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Fab Five Freddy? When... The reason you're working what you're doing, because your group didn't sell those kind of records, but your videos played on my shows. Living in the moment, did you realize the impact that y'all were having? Did you realize the significance that this show was having and the celebrity that you had? Because- Have. That you have, correct. I but I'm know. speaking in that moment, no, in I, this I, moment. Th this moment to today. Because in, I'm, in, I'm accused of, oh, you know, you, you fell off. Fell off of what? A chair? No. Yes, we realized the impact because once we left New York, mm -hmm. the impact became immense. When we're in New York, you're in New York, there's no such thing as a celebrity, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. We all walk the streets, we're all cool, we're all this, we're the same, we're Dr. Dre, Ed Lover, we're this, we're that, but our heads are on our shoulder. But when you go to LA and people are like, oh my God, oh, let me get your door. Oh, my, oh, did you want this? Oh, let me have this. Oh, we're going out to Atlanta. Oh, all the chicks are taking off clothes for us. Well, that wasn't that bad. But yeah. <laughs> when you get to Miami and Luke and I are throwing birthday parties for each other because our birthdays are on the same time and they're huge and, they're, and we get thrown out of a city called Detroit because the party's so over the top. You know, we get tossed out. We have to sleep in the airport. Yeah, we know how large we were with that.